The mill pond. The mill pond, shown in the foreground, is the final step in the transportation which brings the timber to the mill for processing. The worker guides the logs to the trough, which is equipped with a traveling chain called a bull chain. Metal projections on the bull chain catch the log, causing it to be carried up the trough. The illustration shows only the end of the pond by the mill. At one side of the illustration, there will likely be the railroad tracks, flume, road, or the river, by means of which the logs have arrived at the mill pond. Sometimes the mill pond is part of a river. In such cases, the river is usually dammed to provide a body of barely still water from which the logs are taken into the mill. There are many types of mill ponds. The type used will depend upon the physical features of the area. Washing and first cutoff. As each piece of timber comes up the trough, it is subjected to a thorough washing with water under great pressure. This is to remove dirt, sand, gravel, and other foreign matter which might dull or break the saw. The breaking of the saw is very dangerous inasmuch as the pieces are usually thrown with tremendous force. They have been known to be thrown hundreds of feet and then bury themselves in trees. After the log has been washed, it is carried to a cutoff saw which cuts it into lengths and usually trims up the ends. These two operations are the first the log undergoes as it is made into lumber. Log sawing and veneer cutting. The carrier next takes the log to the band saw. When the log is placed properly, a signal is given and the log is slowly moved against the band saw, which cuts a slice the length of the log. The first slice will have bark on one side and will be carried away to a separate pile. The next slice, or rough board, is then automatically placed on a moving platform which carries the board to the edger, which trims the edges and squares up the board. The board then moves on to the next process. Notice the two small diagrams which show A, the end view of sawing a log, and B, the end view of an edger at work. The band saws on the edger are constructed so they may be moved apart for a wide board and closer together for a narrow board. Diagram C shows how large sheets of veneer are obtained. The log is first soaked to make it pliable and then placed into a frame that causes it to revolve against a very sharp knife. This method of cutting veneer may only be used on such woods as fir and pine. The wood must be fairly soft. The log is unwound, much as a piece of wrapping paper from a roll, until there is just a small round pole left. In D is shown the method of obtaining quarter sawed veneer. The log is first cut square and it is plain sawed on one side until the center is almost reached. It is then sent to the veneer knife and a few slices cut off. This quarter sawed veneer is very beautifully grained and will not warp, as being near the center of the tree the strains are about equal on either side of the board. Veneer cut by the slicing process will not warp for the same reason as quarter sawed, but the boards are only half as wide. The boards are cut from the outside to the center of the log. Each light shaded section on the picture will be sliced into veneer strips. More veneer is obtained from a given log by this method, but the grain is not as marked as with quarter sawed. F shows the appearance and position of the quarter sawed board as it comes from the log. G shows the part from which plain sawed boards are cut. Plain sawed boards have a tendency to warp toward what was the outside of the tree and hence are not as valuable as the center cuts of the same tree. Gang saw and trimming. The left hand illustration shows how smaller logs are usually cut into boards by the use of a gang saw. The gang saw is constructed of many saws moving at the same time. These saws move up and down about 250 times a minute. The log is put between rollers on the other side of the saws and the rollers feed it slowly into the saws. 
This is a rapid process as all boards are cut at one time. The logs must first have had two sides plane sawed to remove the bark and eliminate the necessity for edging. The right hand picture shows a trimming table. A man, not shown in the picture, looks each board over carefully. He then decides what must be done to it to get the most good lumber from it. As each piece approaches the saws, he presses buttons which automatically drop them down to the level of the table. The saws cut the boards into the lengths decided upon. A long board with a knot in the center will become three pieces, two good boards and a scrap with the knot in it. These scraps or mill blocks are sold for firewood. The trimming table shown is very modern and is usually only used by large lumber mills. Sorting the green lumber. As boards leave the trimming table, they pass two or three men known as lumber graders. These men are very highly trained in looking at the boards and marking them as first, second, or third grade lumber. They are then carried down the green chain to the sorters and the lumber pilers. The green chain is a movable chain for carrying the green lumber as it is called before it is dried or cured. These men watch the marks made by the graders and pick out the boards which are the same length and grade. The lumber is then piled on small flat cars to be carried into the curing yard. Stacking Green Lumber This picture shows how the lumber is brought to the curing yard and piled. The boards are carried on the small cars to the desired location by the small engine. A piling lift is shown in operation. The boards are placed on the hooks and automatically raised to the top of the pile where the pilers take them and place them in a position. Each stack of lumber is of uniform size and grade. The boards are laid so that the air may circulate through the pile. This is done by laying the boards like a floor. Three or four boards are then laid across the floor, one board at each end and one or two boards at the center. Another floor is then placed in position. This is done before the pile has reached the desired height. The boards must remain in the drying yard for a few months to allow the sun and air thoroughly to cure them. As green lumber will crack and warp if used immediately, it is not sold until it has been cured. Another method of curing lumber is called kiln drying. A kiln for drying lumber is a large room where the temperature has been raised very high by steam radiators or piping. The lumber is piled in the kiln in the same manner as the curing yard, as the hot dry air will remove the excess moisture in a short time as compared to the natural action of the sun and the wind. The lumber need only be left in the kiln a few days to be ready for market and use. Finishing and Storing Lumber When the boards have been cured, the better grades are sent to the planing mill. Here they will be finished. Two operations are shown in the illustration. Upper left shows a board being run through a planer. This machine planes or smooths the board. A series of very sharp knives mounted on a steel cylinder revolving at a very high speed are used to cut off the rough parts of the board and finish it for use. The boards are placed between rollers which draw them over the knives and onto the pull-off table. They are then stored in sheds for shipment to various markets. The upper right picture shows a resaw machine which is used to make boards into siding for buildings. The boards are fed into the machine, which planes them thinner on one edge and cuts a notch in the other, CA in the illustration. These boards fit closely together and overlap to make a weather-tight seam. Lower left shows the manner in which lumber is being carried around within the storage sheds and the method of piling. The bundles are carried by an overhead track to the proper location and then placed in the piles. The illustration at the lower right shows the storage shed of a town lumber yard. This is the final stop before the lumber is sold for building or manufacturing. The Forest Service. The upper left illustration shows a forest lookout tower. This tower is used in locating forest fires. A 
Power of this type is more usually employed in gently rolling or level country. These lookout towers and the lookouts are a very important part of the fire control program of the national forests, national parks, and large privately owned forests. They are connected with a central office by telephone and quite often with radio. As a general rule, the only touch the lookout has with the civilized world during the fire season. During this season, which lasts from May to October, the lookout is on duty from dawn until late at night. Another type of lookout tower is shown in upper right. This type is common to the most mountainous regions. These are often more difficult of access than the tower type. They are located on high and fairly sharp peaks and are often only reached by a rough mountain trail. Airplanes are often used in conjunction with the lookout towers and houses. These are generally used only in scouting large fires. As the lookout is at a location that is often many miles from the fire, he can only see the smoke and therefore cannot accurately judge the condition, rate of spread, or direction in which the fire is burning. The airplane overcomes this difficulty by being able to fly over and around the fire and report on the condition in a very short time. The old mounted forest ranger is fast giving way to the ranger in a small light car. At the lower right is a good example of how fires were spotted in the earlier days. This forest ranger carried about a week's supply of food with him when he started his patrol. Any fires encountered during this time, which were fairly small, were fought until they were extinguished. Fires which were too large for one man to handle usually were fought until the smoke had attracted help from neighboring patrolmen. Fires fought by this slow method often burned over many square miles of good timbered country. Under the more modern and efficient firefighting practices of today, only in rare cases do the fires assume these proportions. Tools used in fire control. This illustration shows some of the tools used in modern fire control. The firefighting pump, upper left, is intended for use on grass fires and in the mop-up work on larger fires. It is so constructed that it may be carried on the back by means of straps over the shoulders. The pump is attached to clamps on the top and is removable for use. In combating large fire, it is often necessary to start a backfire. A small fire started and controlled for the purpose of burning over the area on which the main fire is advancing. When the main fire reaches this burned over area, it dies for lack of fuel. The tank on the backfiring torch used contains kerosene and the burner attached to the flexible hose operates in the same manner as a blowtorch. The McLeod tool is used to remove leaves, grass, and other small debris in constructing a fire trail. The PV, as we have seen, is used to roll logs. The portable pump is used on fires which are near streams. Like the backpack pump, this pump is small and light enough to be carried to the fire. It operates from a small built-in gasoline engine. These pumps greatly speed the work in stopping a fire and mopping up, extinguishing all burning material inside the fire line. Tools used in lumbering. This miscellaneous detail page shows various tools used in lumbering. The ranger's marking axe is used to mark trees for felling and mark the logs after they have been cut, measured, and checked. The steel wedge is used in felling trees to prevent the tree from binding the saw and to start the tree to fall. The cant hook is used to turn logs and differs only from the PV in that it has no sharp steel point on the handle. The mattock is used in firefighting to remove vines, cut brush, and remove the forest litter, semi-decayed leaves, small branches, twigs, etc. The equipment house shown is quite standard in heavily forested areas. Sufficient tools and emergency rations, food, is stored to outfit a small crew of men in fighting a small fire. Before building a campfire in a forest, care must be taken to remove all combustible material from an area 10 feet on all sides of the fire. A small hole is dug in which the fire is built. In extinguishing a campfire, it is well to completely cover it with dirt and then soak thoroughly with water, stirring the dirt and coals until no steam arises. These points are well to remember because the future of our forests depends upon the care with which they are used. The greatest loss to the lumber industry and to the country as a whole is affected yearly by fire. A little care on the part of each forest user will do much to prevent this loss. Fighting Forest Fire The upper left picture shows all that remains of what was once a densely forested slope. 
fire that swept through this area has not only completely destroyed the stand of timber, but has killed much wildlife, ruined wildlife shelter, and destroyed the seed which would have reseeded this forest and made it a lumber producing area. It will take 50 to 100 years for this area to become of use again as forest land, even if artificially seeded or planted. The lower picture shows a group of men fighting a forest fire. These men must corral the fire, that is, build a trail completely around it to stop the spread and to continue to work until the fire is out. The tank truck shown in the foreground is of great help if the fire is burning in the vicinity of a usable road. The illustration at the upper right shows a forest garden or tree nursery. Seeds collected by the Forest Service, forest experiment stations, etc. are planted in rows. They are cared for and watered until they have reached about a foot or a foot and a half in height. They will then be shipped to forest areas that have been burned or to new areas and they are planted under the guidance of forest rangers.